gentle viewers to cult theatre, but the RE at the end of theatre means we're classy. Suppose an introduction is in order. I am Katrina Van Helsing, ex-vampire hunter. The reason why I'm an ex-vampire hunter may be summed up in one word. Twilight. Yes. Apparently, vampires aren't smelly, horrid fiends of the undead. They're poor, misunderstood babies who just need a cuddle. Never mind about all that blood drinking and leaving nothing but a desiccated corpse for our parents to find in the morning. No, no, no. They, they really are quite nice once you get to know them. Ugh. Give me the old days. When vampires didn't brood sexually in romantic places, they bloody well killed people! Fortunately, I still have Hammer films to remind me of what vampires are really like. Like today's film, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Now, Prince of Darkness is technically the third Dracula film that Hammer made, but it's the first direct sequel to the first film, the Horror of Dracula. The second film, The Brides of Dracula, didn't have Dracula in it at all, although Van Helsing is in the movie, and I'll probably get to Brides of Dracula another time. But let's focus on The Prince of Darkness. We kick things off with a recap of what happened at the end of Horror of Dracula, aka the best part of the whole damn movie. The death of Dracula by sunlight and makeshift cross. Dracula turns to dust, and we get the opening credits. Then we start where all good horror movies start, with a funeral. In this case, it's a young girl who's dearly departed, and she's about to get the special treatment. Staked to the heart and set on fire. The proper way to dispose of any potential vampire victims. The mum objects. Like they always do. And we get a second interruption to the proceedings, in the form of Brother Killjoy and his horse. Seems the good brother finds this whole thing barbaric. Beware. We can't take any chances. Quite right, too. Set her on fire anyway. But no, apparently the girl isn't a victim of a vampire because she doesn't have any marks on her neck. Like they never thought of biting her somewhere else. And Brother Killjoy buggers off, leaving a few choice threats in his wake. We then cut to an English tourist having a drinking contest at a quaint local inn. This is Charles, a hero. And this is his brother Alan, and Alan's wife Helen, and Charles' wife Diana. Four English tourists on holiday in Eastern Europe. Just been planning about the tea, or they don't make it properly, do they? Now that I've gotten the obligatory they never make the tea right joke out of the way, Brother Killjoy, whose name is actually Father Sandor, but I like calling him Brother Killjoy, walks in and gives the locals grief over the fact that they hang garlic around the place. Then he meets our tourist friends and gives them the dire warning of the movie. And if you do decide to disregard my advice, at least stay well clear of the castle. Of course, they don't take this seriously because foreigners are funny, aren't they? Although, to be fair to the tourists, Brother Killjoy doesn't give them a reason not to go near the castle. He just says, don't go near the castle, which is vague and makes them think he's trying to drum up some pilgrimage business for his abbey. A little bit of advice for all you dire warning givers. Be specific. If you know that there is a reason why somebody should not go to a certain place, tell them exactly that. Tell them exactly why. So, in the end, it saves you both a lot of trouble, and if they don't follow your warning, then it's their own fault. The next day finds our intrepid tourists stranded by their coachman, who has decided that he won't go any further on account of darkness means dinner bell for vampires. They're about to bed down in a nearby hut when a driver's coach appears. Lucky! Only the coach seems intent on taking them to the big creepy castle that they spotted earlier. Not so lucky. When they arrive at the castle, Helen wigs out a bit, but the others laugh it all off. 
After all, it's not like driverless coaches and creepy castles that they've been told to stay away from or anything to be worried about. Well, if you'd listened to me back there at the crossroads, we wouldn't be in this state now. Oh, if we'd listened to you, Helen, we'd still be in England. Would that be bad? Anyway, after arriving, the lads have a look around while the ladies stay downstairs to get spooked by the butler. <laughs> Clove, and he helpfully informs them that, although his master is dead, said master left special instructions that, should anyone wander up to the castle, they were to be made welcome and given a comfy place to stay. Not seeing anything odd in this, the tourists make a toast. Here's to him. May he rest in peace. Count Dracula. Count, Count Dracula. Dracula. I was expecting a nice big boom of thunder after that, not a piddling little wind. You've let me down, Hammer! After they've been fattened up, I mean fed, they settle in upstairs for a good night's sleep. Only Helen wakes up after she thinks she hears someone calling her name, and wakes up Alan as well. After hearing some noises outside their room, and seeing Chloe dragging a big trunk around, Alan decides to go investigate, promising his wife that he'll be back soon. Taking bets now, gentle viewers, will he get back to his jittery wife? <laughs> Guess not. Hmm. Club then hangs Alan upside down and slits his throat and... Look, I know gravity works, but I don't think it works so well that Alan's entire supply of blood will come up that quickly. Also, that seems an awful lot of blood for one person, but I'm not a doctor, so what do I know? At any rate, Clove has succeeded in bringing Dracula back to unlife. <laughs> Give it. Because he's undead. <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> yeah. Clove then ducks back upstairs to get Helen, and poor Helen finds out what happened to her husband. Of course, the kind-hearted and hospitable host Dracula is there to comfort the poor woman. Or turn her into one of his vampiric minions, either way. The next morning, Charles and Diana can't find their wayward relatives anywhere, and they make the first reasonable decision they've made for the whole movie. They decide to leave the castle. But it seems that it's the only good decision they make when Charles decides that instead of going to the nearest village for help, or possibly finding the priest who gave them the warning about the castle in the first place, he's going back to the castle alone to find out what happened to his brother and sister-in-law. Charles finds Alan, at least, stuffed into the trunk that Clove dragged down from the attic. Diana also ends up back at the castle, having been lured there by Clove, and gets the front door locked behind her. The pair then gets attacked by Dracula and the now undead Helen, but manage to escape in the cart that Clove used to get Diana back to the castle. After crashing the cart and wandering around the woods for a while, they end up at the abbey where Brother Killjoy and the rest of his order live. Brother Killjoy scolds Charles a little, but nothing too harsh. He then fills Charles in on what needs to be done now that they've got a vampire after them. And here we get the first of some tidbits from the original book that weren't included in the first movie. Brother Killjoy introduces Charles to another traveller who was in a similar predicament, but fared far worse. Meet Ludwig, everybody! He'll be our Renfield-type character for this movie. Oh, and look who's shown up at the front door! It's Clove! with a couple of coffin-shaped boxes in the back of its wagon. I wonder what they could be for. Back inside, Brother Killjoy and Charles have decided that the best plan is to send Diana home to England, and Killjoy and Charles will go to the castle and dispatch Dracula. Getting Diana away from the Carpathians is a good idea for one very important reason. Yes, it seems that Dracula, aside from being a blood-sucking monster, 
He's also a dreadful misogynist. He considers that she belongs to him already. He will want her badly. Oh yes, he's a right proper dreamboat. We also get the very subtle hint that Dracula can only enter the Abbey if he's invited in by someone who's already inside. And Ludwig promptly inviting Dracula inside. Oops. Dracula's coming plan does go a bit pear-shaped, however, and Helen is captured by the monks, and we get our obligatory staking scene. <laughs> Dracula may be down one undead minion, but he still has Ludwig to help him. Ludwig lures Diana into Brother Killjoy's empty study and locks the door behind her. This seems to be coming a habit, Diana. You might want to check with someone before you go wandering off with a stranger that you just met. We then get our second book nod when Dracula cuts open his chest and tries to get Diana to drink from the wound. And in case you haven't noticed, Dracula hasn't spoken a word this entire movie. Supposedly that's because Christopher Lee didn't like the dialogue they had written for him and refused to speak it. Oddly enough, I think this works in the movie's favour, as it makes Dracula a more frightening and mysterious villain. Not necessarily an effective villain, however, as he gets interrupted before he can turn Diana, and he runs off after breaking the French doors with a swooning Diana in his arms. Now, I'm not entirely sure that the chase that ensues is necessarily a book nod, mostly because the scene where the heroes chase down the vampire is in almost every vampire movie ever, but we get a chase in anyway. Charles and Brother Killjoy catch up to Dracula's wagon, and Clove is killed. The wagon then takes off for the castle, and crashes right at the gate, knocking Dracula's coffin out onto the frozen moat. Charles and Killjoy make sure Diana's safe, and Charles goes after Dracula before the sun sets. He's just a little bit too late, however, and a struggle between Charles and Dracula ensues. Diana tries to help out by shooting Dracula, but misses and hits the ice of the frozen moat beneath the combatants. Brother Killjoy then says that because they're fighting on top of running water, the heroes can use this to kill Dracula. It's not running water though, it's a moat. And it's not that vampires necessarily drown in it, it's that they can't cross it. But I'm letting that go as the movie is almost over. Brother Killjoy shoots a hole in the ice, which causes the ice to start breaking up, and Dracula gets pulled under, thus ending the movie. And roll credits. And that was Dracula, Prince of Darkness. And what do I think? To be honest, this isn't one of Hammer's best. It's rather average overall. The acting is fair, Christopher Lee is excellent despite not saying a single word, and the costumes and sets are fairly average for a Hammer production. Really, that's all that can be said for this movie. As far as Hammer films are concerned, it's utterly average. This is the last Hammer Dracula film that director Terence Fisher would work on, and they only got worse from here. Rather like all those slasher sequels that Hollywood is so fond of churning out. However, it's worth pointing out that Hammer is still putting out good horror movies. They produced Let Me In, the English language version of Let the Right One In, and the 2012 Daniel Radcliffe vehicle The Woman in Black. The website even touts them as being one of the oldest film production companies still in operation, as they were producing movies long before they got into the horror game. In the end, Dracula Prince of Darkness is thoroughly average for a Hammer film. Of course, thoroughly average for a Hammer film is still miles ahead of studios like The Asylum. And if you're a Hammer fan, like I am, it's still worth checking out. Next time, we'll be looking at the first of two Vincent Price films. And for some of my younger viewers, I'll be introducing you to the glories of one William Castle. And by glories, I mean cheese. Lots and lots of cheese. I'm a
color of blood The night the pirates came to the vampire club The leader was tall and snide and slim He looked like a gay Captain Morgan Well, he recognized the vampire from his school He did something that was most unfair